to welcome Community Alliance Church. We're excited that you're here with us, and uh, we look forward to uh, great worship and uh, learning about what God has in mind for us today. So, uh, I do not have any particular announcements. Does anybody have anything that needs to be covered real quick? If not, I will ask uh, Heather to make an announcement, and then I'll open in prayer. No. Oh, now I am. Good morning. Um, so I had two announcements. Sorry, Dave, I told you only one, and I didn't mean to not tell the truth. <laughs> um, so on, f not February, June, June 20th is Father's Day. Um, and just like the men for Mother's Day did a little something special for us moms, uh, we want to do something special for them. And so we are having a Father's Day picnic type meal um and eileen talked about it last week and um she asked me because they are away to pass around this sign up sheet we do have some needs still on it the church is doing the hamburgers and hot dogs um, but there's a couple other places where you can sign up if you want to bring something that's not on here just write it down we would love to be able to just um show the men the dads in our church how much we love them and honor them and um, that care about them, just like they did for us when uh, it was Mother's Day. So if you would, can you pass that? Thank you. And then the other announcement is um, youth group is starting back up again tonight from 6 to 7.30. For anyone who is in sixth grade, going into sixth grade this fall through 12th grade. Um, but we are really excited, Bryce and Jess and I. We recently gave the youth room a complete, minus the carpet, which is coming soon, <laughs> a complete overhaul. We painted, we decorated, we um, added some really fun touches. We would love for you as you are leaving to go check out the room. Um, when you walk out of the sanctuary, it's the first door on your left. Check it out as you leave. We would love it if you would invite kids, cousins, family members, neighbors, anybody you happen to know. See them on the street. Say, hey, there's a youth group at Community Alliance Church. Um, they might look at you like you're crazy, but that's okay. Um, when you're in youth ministry, you tend to get people looking at you like you're crazy a lot. <laughs> right, Bryce? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so we get used to it. Um, but anyway, but the biggest thing that we need you to do for us is we need you to pray. We need you to pray that we can reach the kids not only in our church but in our community. Last year before COVID, we were having 17 kids in our youth group, and it was amazing. Um, but then COVID happened, and I know with a lot of churches, they've lost a lot of youth members um, to other things. And so we are just ask you, we covet your prayers this morning, that we would just be able to reach people, the teenagers in our community, um, in our lives for Jesus. So if you know somebody, please, please, please invite them. Um, we're going to have a really fun night tonight. Um, and we start at 6 and we end at 7.30. Thank you. I'm going to have you, uh, that's a sign up list for the ladies. So if you'll just pass that on. I didn't know if Amy was coming or not. All right, be in prayer for Pastor and Eileen as they travel. I know that uh, earlier this week they were in the Alliance Conference at uh, Nashville. They're in Nashville, and uh, that is now uh, completed, and they are taking some vacation time and working their way back to Bloomsburg. So this, this morning we get to hear Pastor Al, and uh, that will be exciting hear what the Lord has put on his heart. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for just a wonderful and a beautiful day that you've given us today. We thank you for the safety as we travel here. And uh, Lord, we just ask you to open our hearts and minds to what you've laid on Pastor Al's uh, tongue today. Lord, we ask for a blessing from you, and we ask that the, we would honor and glorify you throughout the day and this week. Again, Lord, thank you for everything you've uh, given and blessed us with. In your name, amen. Well, we are excited to worship the Lord this morning. <clears throat> Billy Graham once said, my home is in heaven. I'm just traveling through this world. And that's actually the quote that I have on my Facebook page, but I think about it every now and then. Um, and I was thinking about it last night. Our first song is called Better is One Day, and the chorus says, better is one day in your courts 
Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. And I know that if you're like me, it's really easy to get caught up in what we think this world has to offer us. We look at all the things that people have, all the things that we have and that we want and we can do. And sometimes um, if we let it, that can overshadow the eternity with God that we're promised as followers of him. And when I think about that quote from Billy Graham and I think about these words in our song that we're going to sing, I think that we just need to remind ourselves that this world can look beautiful at times. We have good things in our lives here on this earth, but this is not our final destination. This is not where we are going to spend eternity. And when we consider what eternity looks like, this earth pales in comparison. Mm. And so it is better to spend one day in the presence of the Lord, whether it's in your prayer closet, whether it's here with your family of believers, whether it's in heaven with God, it's better to spend one day in his presence than it is to spend a lifetime and eternity anywhere else. And so I just urge you and ask you as we stand to worship this morning that you would just remember that, that you would just allow that thought to just penetrate into your heart, into your mind, um, burn it into your memory so that we can live with the perspective that all of this will burn one day, but the kingdom of heaven is forever. Would you please stand with us as we get ready to worship? Father God, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts that we're here and that we're able to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. We look forward to what you have in store for us. We look forward to how you're going to move in each of our hearts and lives. And so God, I pray that you would just allow us to put aside whatever might be distracting us this morning, keeping us from fully putting our focus on you, Lord. We want this service, every part of it, to honor and glorify you and to be only for you because we love you and we praise you and we honor you because you're so worthy of all of that. I pray all of this and that you'll be glorified in it during our worship in your precious name, amen.
Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for the reminder, Lord, that this is not our final destination here. And this is part of the journey, Lord. And Father God, just encourage my heart, Father, to know that we will be with you in heaven and we'll be able to worship your great name without any feeling of pain and suffering and sadness. And it would just be joy and peace. But Father God, we don't have to wait until then to experience that. You are with us here in this journey. You are with us, encouraging us, lifting us up. And because of that, Father God, we can stand and sing and lift our hands to you and shout, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And we bow down and worship you. And how great and awesome are you, Father. And we thank you, Lord, that in the midst of everything we go through, that doesn't change that truth. And so, Father God, I just pray that your spirit would just move in this place, move in our hearts. Help us to keep our eyes on you right now. Help us to give our hearts, our spirit to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
holy, Lord, this morning. We confess that. We declare it to you this morning that you are holy. You are righteous. You are wonderful. There are so many words to describe you, God. We can't even, we can't even fit them all into one service here. But we are so honored and grateful that you choose to love us despite what and who we are. We are so grateful and honored that you come into our presence. And this morning, Lord, we believe your words that say where two or more are gathered in your name than you are here. And so we know that your presence is here this morning. And so we ask as Pastor Al comes up to share your word, that your presence will be felt all throughout this building, that your presence would be felt in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. I pray that you would anoint Pastor Al with your spirit from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet that he will share the message that you have put on his heart, that these will be your words and that they will change us, that they will convict us, that they will help us to know how to serve you better and love you better and be more like the people that you want us to be. We thank you once again for your presence here in this place. In your name I pray, amen. You can all be seated. Praise the Lord. We good back there? Amen. Good morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. And uh, bless those songs this morning. You know, Psalm 8410, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I almost preached on that one. But, I, well, I did. But, I mean, praise the Lord. That was, that's excellent. This really is good. So I'm honored to be here today. Thank, I want to thank Pastor and you guys, church, for allowing me to come and share God's word with you this morning. So before we go into the word of God, let's just pray, open in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord. You are our Lord and our God and our Father. Lord, we open our hearts to you this day. We open our hearts, our soul, our spirits, our mind to you, Lord God, and we pray that you will impart from heaven into each and every one of us gathered here today, that you will nourish us and grow us in our most holy faith. We come to praise you and to worship you and to receive all that heaven has for us, Lord. Continue to change us and mold us and fashion us into the image of your Son, Jesus. Now, Lord, let your anointing flow and let your word come into each and every one of our hearts. And Holy Spirit, take that living word and seal it within us that will, it will forever Change and transform us for your glory, for your kingdom, and for your name's sake. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to be in the house of the Lord, right? How many of you rejoiced this morning? The Bible says, I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning, I want to look at the word desire and as you're gonna, we're going to look into the life of King David and see what that is really saying to us and to our heart and soul and spirit this morning. Praise the Lord. Our text for today is Psalm 27, verse 4. 
and it reads like this. It says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Praise the Lord. Desire is, desires are, are what drive our everyday actions, and our desires are what make us who we are. I watched a series one time called Men Who Built America, and it was the story of men like uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, John Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, Henry Ford, these are men that all had a desire and a passion to change the world, to make it better for, for, the, for everyone, and they amassed great fortunes in doing so. They put all their time, all their effort, their entire passion was to do what they intended to do. Vanderbilt built railroads and shipyards. Rockefeller became an oil king, and he became really the richest man that we know of, even in today's standards, other than Jeff Bezos, maybe, who's, I work for, Amazon. <laughs> and then you had others, Carnegie, steel, ma steel magnet, right? Created all kinds of stuff. They amassed fortune, fortunes. Henry Ford, J.P. Morgan. And when J.P. Morgan passed away, they were, at, this, at this time, they, were, they had amassed a large amount of wealth. They had amassed a large amount of wealth. And when Morgan died, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller and Carnegie were at the grave site, and they said, we can't take our money with us. And they began to give it all away. They began to start foundations and all kinds of things that would help benefit the medical world, science, and everything. They started giving all that they had massed, they had started to give it away in foundation. They realized they couldn't take it with them. And the song for that series was by a man called Blue Saraceno, and part of the words of that song was, I can't save your soul. I can't promise you forever. But you know, Jesus says, when our God, the Word of God declares that when our desire and our passion is to know God, to walk with God, to live with God, to be guided and directed by God, God's Word says He promises us eternity forever with Him. No man can promise you that. No amount of money can promise you forever, but God's Word through Jesus Christ says, I can promise you eternity. How many of you believe that you will be with the Lord God for eternity? Amen? That is a promise of God. And God says that as you live for me and allow me to be your Lord and Savior and walk with you, you will amass treasures, not of this earth, but your treasure, the Bible says, will be in heaven that no man can take away. So the things that you do for the kingdom of God, for the love of God, for Jesus on this earth, as God leads you and directs you, you're amassing treasure that no man can take with you. And as you get into heaven, great will be your reward, the Bible says. You see, Rockefeller and Carnegie and those men, their money stood in the bank on the face of this earth, and other men divided it up. But when you serve and walk with the Lord God, your treasure is in heaven, and God rewards you and blesses you with that treasure that no man, that no one can take. We want to look at King David this morning. David, the son of Jesse, the Bible declares him to be a man after God's own heart. It says it in Samuel, as the prophet Samuel said to Saul, Saul, basically, you, you sinned, you, you did wrong, your kingdom is going to be taken, and it's going to be given to one whose heart is after God. It's referring to David. And in the New Testament, too, 
It says that David was a man after God's own heart. He wanted to know God. He wanted to understand the things about God. He wanted to have that personal relationship with the Lord God Almighty. And as David says here in Psalm 24, one thing have I desired. Now, there's many things that we can desire. And David, I'm sure, desired more than one thing. But what David is saying is the most important thing, the most important thing, the number one desire in my life. You see, David says one thing I have desired, a personal choice to desire to know the Lord God Almighty. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. And in the New Testament, David said he wanted to know. He wanted to dwell in the house of the Lord. In the New Testament, the word talks about abide in me. God is a God of fellowship and relationships. God in the New Testament, Jesus says, abide in me and we will abide in you. My Father, my word, Jesus and the Holy Spirit will abide in you. God is a God of relationships. In the Old Testament, when he built the tabernacle, he told Moses, build me a tabernacle in the wilderness because I want to dwell amongst my people. God always initiated the desire to be with his people, to be active in their lives to be the one who leads them and guides them and provides for them. Isn't that good? God didn't have to do that. He could have just looked from heaven and said, hey, you're on your own. Do your best. I'll help you out when I can. God didn't say that. God says, I want to dwell in the midst of you to lead you and to guide you, to help you and to provide for you. Didn't he provide for them in the wilderness, the manna? And then people got sick of the manna and said, Ew, manna, all right, hey, you don't want it? How's that working for you? <laughs> but God always was a God who was a, a God of relationship. He wanted to know each and every one of us, and he wanted to be with us. And so being a man after God's own heart means I wanted to abide I wanted to live in the presence of God so that I could know him, that I could hear his voice, and that I could learn from him and walk with him. So the priorities of our life, I want to go here first. The priority of our life. Everything starts and begins with faith. The book of Hebrews in 11.6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You understand what I'm saying, what the word of God is saying? God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We don't seek God for reward. We seek God because of his great love, of who he is. But as we seek the Lord, God automatically pours out blessings upon your life. Those men I talked about earlier, they pursued things, and, and, and the men purchased and bought those things that brought blessing on them. But as we serve the Lord, God pours out blessings and rewards into our lives that's far more valuable than money. Money is good, and we need money, don't we? You need money to pay your bills. I don't know, does anybody here live without needing money? No, right? But the things that God gives us, love, peace, joy, patience, the things that God imparts to our life go far beyond any riches of this world. No silver, no gold, no amount of, of, of money in your bank account can give you what God can give you. People work their whole lives and become famous and, and have fortunes, 
and they commit suicide, they, they, there's something void in their life. But when you walk with God, you have a peace that passeth all understanding that guards your heart and your mind and your soul. In this psalm, David, you know, King David did not have a, a pleasant life. He was always, I mean, if you look at the life of David and you, you study that, you see how many things he has gone through. He was pursued. He was, he was, he was, they were trying to kill him. Everybody throughout his life, David did not have an easy life. We're going through stuff in life. We have hard times in life. David will say, well, tell me about it. I've been there, done that, and more. David was running for his life, right, out to kill him and everything else. But and in, this soul, in this psalm, David is in, in a, is in a terrible place. His enemies are, are surrounding him. His enemies are there to get him. They want to kill him. They want to do him in. But David is saying one thing. He says one thing in the midst of all this. Everybody's around him wanting to, wanting to do him in. And David doesn't say, Lord, bring, like, who was it, James and John? Bring down fire and destroy them, right? David didn't pray that prayer. Those weren't the, right? David said, turns around, and what does he do? He looks to the Lord God, and he says, Lord, one thing have I desired, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see, David had a personal relationship with the Lord God. God was his passion, his number one desire. How he got that, we don't know, but we know one thing. It was a personal choice. And every one of us here has a personal choice to choose to allow God to be number one in our lives, that we want to know him and seek him above all else. We have jobs. We have to go to work. It's good to learn. It's good to go to school and pursue whatever it is you're pursuing and gain knowledge in that area. That's all good. But above all of that is to know the Lord God Almighty, to know his love, his grace, his mercy, his compassions that are new upon you every morning. To know the Lord is the greatest thing of all. So David had that relationship with Lord. And God had given David victory over foes that were larger than him, that were more powerful than he was. In this life, as you live life, you're going to face situations and circumstances that are more powerful than you, greater than you, and you don't know how you're going to handle these things. I don't know if anyone's been there where you faced a situation or a circumstance, a medical condition or something or whatever, that you say, I, I don't know, I can't deal with this. I can't overcome this. Uh, it's too much for me. So what do you do in those situations? When David had that, he was, a, he was the shepherd of his father's sheep, and he was out there, you know, young guy with his staff, and a lion came and took the, one of the sheep in his mouth, and he started to go away with it to devour it to have his lunch. And David said, oh, no, that's my father's sheep. You cannot have my father's sheep. And David, the Bible says, went after the lion, slew the lion, took the sheep out of his mouth, and brought it back and, and mended it so it was, became healthy. David, in his own strength, could not do that. But David knew the power of God came upon him that enabled him to overcome something that was greater physically than he was, that had more strength than he did. Do you think a lion has more strength than a young teenage boy watching his father's sheep? Yeah. But except for the power of God on David, David would have become lunch for that lion. And the sheep would have been his dessert. So David learned. It's the Lord's God's strength that enabled me to overcome that, that, that attack. The devil comes to try to steal. The Bible says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
your health, your finances, your family, your relationship between you and your wife, you and your children, to, to destroy whatever. But God gives us the power to be able to overcome what he's trying to do and keep those things in where they belong. Then along comes a bear. A bear is no, no, no pushover. If you see bear in the woods, don't go up and say, hey, how you doing? Shake hands with him. A bear came to the sh to sheep, and the bear took a, a sheep in his mouth and started to walk away. And David said, oh, no, you don't. Uh-uh, not on my watch. He ran after that bear, slew the bear, took the sheep out of his mouth, and brought it back to his father's fold. David was not going to allow himself to be robbed or his father, his household to be robbed by the devil. Do not allow the devil to rob from you that which belongs to you. We've got to rise up and understand in the power of God, we can overtake and take back what the devil is trying to steal from us. David understood this. And when David slew the, the, the lion and the bear, he restored back to his father what was rightfully his. Don't allow the thief to come and steal from your life whatever it is. So David understood and believed that the Lord had strengthened him in the past, and he always fought in the power of God. And then remember when David, the youngest of seven brothers, when they were all out in the army, they all went to battle, and David was left home with the sheep. And David was praising God. And the father said, go, bring this bread and cheese, whatever it was, to, the, to your brothers and to, to them in the battle. In the meantime, in the battlefield, here was Goliath, a giant, right, standing in there, making all kinds of noise and accusations and, come out, who's, who's going to come out and challenge me? And they were all, the Bible says they were all shivering, they're shaking in, the, in, the, in their trenches. Who, they were afraid. And David comes into the scene, and David said, what's going on here? What are you guys afraid of? Who are you afraid of? You're, you, you guys are the army of God. You're, you, God is, is the commander of your, this army. Why are you in your trenches shaking? And they said to David, oh, David said, I'll go out. I'll, I'll go face him because he's defying the armies of Israel, the armies of God. And uh, they said, here, put on this armor. And David said, no, get out of here. I ain't putting on no armor. I don't need that. I need to go in the faith and in the power of God. He is my shield. He is my defender. And little David goes out there with the giant with a slingshot and stones. You know the story, right? The giant says, come here. I'm going to have you for lunch. And David said, oh, no. I come, you come against me in, 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 with shield and sword and whatever the spear, whatever. I come against you in the name of the Lord, the God, the Lord of hosts. He said, because you defied the armies of God. And David took his slingshot. You know the story. Slew the giant, and down he went. And who did David save? David saved the, the family of God, the soldiers. He was saving the sheep for his father, and here he was saving the army for his father God. Hallelujah. He was saving men and lives, the lives of men. He said, no, Goliath, you're not going to have these men for lunch. The birds and, and the beasts of the field are going to have you for lunch. David understood he wasn't facing Goliath in his own strength or in his own power, in his own wisdom or knowledge. He didn't devise a plan and a scheme. David just went out there and he said, by faith, by my faith in the Lord God Almighty, I come against you. And that is what we need to do in our lives, in the situations and circumstances of our lives that rise up, that seem bigger than us, that seem there's no way we can get through this, around it, or whatever. We say, no, in the name of Jesus, 
The Bible says when you go through the fire, you will not drown. When you go through the waters, you will not, dr- I mean, you will not be burned in the fire. And when you go through the waters, you will not drown. God makes a way for us in the greatest and largest of situations and circumstances that in our own we cannot handle or come out on the other side with. But God always makes a way for you when you have faith and trust in the power of God at work in your life. God is out for your good. God is looking out for you. God wants to be your help, your strength, your shield, your defender. He wants to take you and bring you through the situations and circumstances of life that are greater than you, that without God you would crumble and break apart, have breakdowns and fall apart and become destitute. But God says, no, I am the glory and the lifter of your head. I will bless you and bring you through these times. And David understood that. So whenever David faced fear and trouble, he knew where he needed to turn. And in this psalm, as David was was facing all this here, he turned to the Lord God Almighty. And so David professed his faith over the things that could create fear in his life. David encouraged himself in the Lord. In in Samuel, there was a story about David. David had joined the Philistine uh, army with some men. And they were going to go into battle against Saul. And one of the Philistine commanders says, oh, no, David is an Israelite. He has 600 men with him. They're in the rear. If they should turn on us, the battle could go for the Israelites. Send David and his men back home. Don't let them come into battle. He could be a a, a threat to us. And so the commander said, David, take your 600 men and go back to Ziglag. You can't come into battle with us. Go back to Ziglag. So they were like a little down, little, this, little, you know, oh, man, we were just looking forward. But maybe they weren't looking forward to it. But anyway, God sent them back to Ziglag. They get back to Ziglag, and what did they find? The Philistines had burned their, their town, taken their women and children captive. And there was nothing there, and they wept. And the Bible says they wept until they couldn't weep no more. And the men all turned to David and said, David, is this what you did to us? You allowed our families to be destroyed. We should kill you. What should we do with you? You, you, They were were angry at David, to say the least. David was not in a good spot, was he? David was not being lifted up and exalted and praised. They wanted to stone David and do him in. So who does David turn to? Where does David go in a situation like that? In a circumstance like that where everyone has turned against me, it seemed like I've lost everything in life. What do you do? You can can lie down and weep and cry and say, that's it, my life is over, I'm done for, it's all, all, uh, kill me if you want, who cares? David said no. He inquired of the Lord. And the Bible said he has zocked himself. He encouraged himself in the Lord. In the darkest of situations and circumstances, when he didn't know what to do, where to go, what to say, he said, let me encourage myself in the Lord God Almighty. Let me inquire of him, what do I do, Lord? Where do I go? How do I deal with this? How do I get through this? And God, as he inquired of the Lord and praised God, God said to him, David, Take your men and go and overtake them, and you will restore all of your families, and they will all be saved. And David heard the words of God because he encouraged himself in the Lord, and he said, Lord, I need your direction. I need your counsel. I need your guidance in this time and day and hour. Whenever you need God, Whenever you need guidance and you don't know where to turn, turn to God. God will direct your path. And sure enough, God said, go after them and restore what they have stolen. 
And David and his 600 men went, and they overcame. They came to the camp, and they were all celebrating in the camp. And David and his men went into the camp, destroyed the Philistines, and took back all of their families. Not one was lost. Their wives, their children, everyone. Why? Because if David didn't inquire of the Lord, if David didn't encourage himself in the Lord, they would have gave up. Their families would have been captive or killed or whatever. But David says, no. The bear tried to take the sheep. The lion tried to take the sheep. Goliath tried to kill the soldiers. But God said no, and he restored. And God is telling us to go after and take back what God has given us. And David went after them, and he took back what God had given him. Because David would not give up would not give in, and he looked to the right person. He looked to the right source. He looked to the Lord God Almighty. Look to God when you have a, a, a situation or a circumstances, when you need direction, when you need guidance, whatever it is you need in life, turn to the Lord God and seek his face, and he will guide you in and through that. And David says, all the days of my life, I will seek the Lord. And David's delight was to behold the beauty of the Lord. David yearned to live in the presence of God. Not so much in a building or a place. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves to together, as a manner of some is. But David knew that wherever he was, he wanted the presence of God there. When David was with his sheep, he was a psalmist, he was a musician, and David would always sing praises to God. And when you sing praises to God, when you worship before the Lord your God, it just builds your faith. It strengthens you in understanding and knowing in whom you have believed. God is a God who is almighty. God is a God who cares about my life. He cares about my family. He cares about everything that is, he has given me. And so David always sang the praises and the worship of God, and he longed to be in the presence of God to behold his beauty. What is the beauty of God? The beauty of God in Scripture declares that it is his holiness. God is holy. And what does holy mean? That God is incorruptible. God is set apart. He's separate than anything and everyone else. There is no man on earth who is like God. God is separate and apart from all. He's incorruptible. You can't buy God. You can't bribe God. You can't you can, uh, con God. Try whatever you want. It's not going to work. God is incorruptible, and he's righteous. He always does the right thing. Isn't, wouldn't it be good if everybody did the right thing all the time? Not just some of the time. But unfortunately, as human beings, we don't always do the right thing. We might try, but we mess up, don't we? My wife knows. As much as we try, we mess up, don't we? But God is always doing the right thing at the right time. He's a God of righteousness. The Bible calls him the righteous judge of all the earth. When God is sitting in the judgment seat, he's going to judge righteously. Nobody can, can persuade God to judge this way or to judge that way, to judge in this one's favor or that one's favor. God judges according to his righteousness. And God Thank you, Lord. God cannot lie. He just can't lie. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. When we trust God's word, we understand God never changes. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why should we trust God today? Because he never changes. He doesn't lie. The Bible says, am I a man that I should lie? Have I said and not will I bring it to pass? You know, God, when God's word declares something to you, take it to heart. 
Stand upon it. Let it be a rock upon which you stand. It will surely, it will surely do what it says. And so David understand God is incorruptible. God is righteous. God never changes. God cannot lie. Who else should I go to for counsel? Who else? Who, who else's presence should I be in when I need wisdom and guidance than God who is all-knowing, all-sufficient? He's everything. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, right? And so David understood that. And David understood that God's beauty is his love. God's love for you goes beyond anything, any love of this world. People throw that word out. I love you, I love you, I love you. Men say it to women because they want something. Others say it to others just to, to make them feel good. I love you, I love you, I love you. But when God says I love you, he means he's interested and he wants to be part of your life to help you and guide you and bring into your life the things that will bless you and do you good all the days of your life. God's love is, is beyond anything of this world. Don't let the word love that flies around in this world connect with God because it doesn't. God's love is far above the love of this world. Totally different. God says, he, God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God promises you everlasting life if you believe on his son, Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus lived. That's why Jesus died. That's why Jesus ascended and is seated at the right hand of the God, the Father. Jesus lives to make intercession for you, to provide for you. Jesus says to Peter, uh, Peter, Satan wants to shake you like, like, like anything to make your faith fall. But I have prayed that your faith fail not. And that's what David said. My faith isn't going to fail. I don't care what comes against me, a lion, a bear, a giant. My faith is not going to fail. I have faith in God who loves me and cares about me and will provide for me and will protect me and will give me the strength to do what needs to be done in every situation and circumstance. David understood that. The Bible says in Lamentations, his mercies. His compassions are new upon us every morning. Hallelujah. I pray that every day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your mercies and your compassions that are new upon us every morning. That's beautiful to me, that every day his mercies and compassions are new upon me, no matter what I've done, no matter how I messed up. No matter what I fail to do, his mercies and compassions are new upon me. It's like, come on, it's a new day. Let's get going. And God says, what did you do yesterday? I don't remember. Let's go. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That's one of my favorite, favorite hymns. Amazing grace. I don't know why I'm here today. The things I've done in my life, I should not be here today. I should have been long gone. But God, through his mercies and compassion, has kept me, forgiven me, had mercy and compassion on me, washed away my sins in Jesus, and anointed me new and afresh that I might live for him. Life is all about Jesus, living for God in his presence. And so, and it's confidence. David expressed confidence in the Lord that God is his rock, the stronghold of his life that God cares for him. Desiring the wrong thing has consequences. David was king of Israel. He came a long way from a shepherd boy to all through, all through his life. Now he's installed as king of Israel. King of Israel, think about that. You don't get, you don't get higher than, you don't get greater than to be king of Israel. And he loved the Lord. He was a man after God's own heart. But the devil never ceases to try to, to come after us to deflect our desires for God onto something else. No matter who you are, no matter how long you've been walking or living for God, you need to stay awake and understand you have a, a, an enemy 
who will try at any time to get you diverted from the things of God and walking with God. And David was king. His army was out there fighting. And David went on his rooftop, and the devil brought his eye to the woman Bathsheba. You all know the story. David understood what the Scripture said. He had a heart after God, but the devil somehow got his attention onto Bathsheba. And you know the story. David wanted it. He got it into his heart. He wanted to commit adultery with Bathsheba. She was married to Uriah. And he was out in the battlefield fighting for David, one of David's top commanders. And David was desiring his wife. Now here's the king of Israel, a man after God's own heart, desiring a woman he should have no business desiring. And he sent for her. And you know the story. He committed adultery. They had a son. He had Uriah killed. This is what wrong desires bring. Devastation. Deadly consequences. Now David couldn't undo that stuff. He couldn't bring Uriah back to life. He couldn't do away with the child that, that Bathsheba was having. But God, David repented. David repented. Repentance is a good thing. I always preached repentance is a doorway to blessing. Repentance is a doorway to blessing. When you repent of your sins, God is quick to come in and forgive and to restore. God didn't throw David away. God understood his sin. David repented, and as a result, their son the, that they had in adultery died. But they, God did not give up on David. God continued to anoint him and bless him after he repented. Desiring a good thing. We can desire good things. When I saw my wife, I heard, heard, heard. <laughs> looking good. <laughs> I had a desire to get to know her. I went over to her house, brought her flowers. That's a long story. I won't get into it, but I went over to her house, brought flowers, gave it to her mother. And her mother said, come on right in. <laughs> <laughs> and I went in and, and I, I met my wife. After I met her, I knew I was in love. And from that point on, she was my desire. I mean, I, I loved the Lord. I desired God. But she was my desire. Every day, I, I had my own business. I was, I was driving around. And so I made sure I got to her house just before she was getting home. I wanted to be there when she got home. I wanted to greet her, smile, hug her, you know, whatever. And I, you know, I just, I had that desire. I just was in love. And that was my desire. Nothing could keep me away. I had a customer, I'll, I'll, we'll schedule, we, we'll reschedule you for tomorrow. I, I have something important coming up. I was there, right? She had a little red car. When I seen that little red car coming around the corner, I said, woohoo, here she comes. <laughs> I couldn't wait. And that was, that's desiring a good thing. But my prayer was always, you see, I was single most of my life. And my prayer was always, Lord, I'm content with being single. I'll serve you all the days of my life. I love you. But if you give me a wife, she has to love you more than she loves me. Because I know if she loves the Lord God with all her heart, soul, and strength, she's going to love this guy who's not so perfect. Right? So I said, Lord, I'll serve you, but if you give me a wife, let her love you more than she loves me. And I told my wife, let's get married next week. She said, no, we got we to gotta wait. <laughs> got to wait. <laughs> wait a while. And we waited a while, and we got married. Now, that's a good desire. And then there's the best desire of all. The best desire of all is to know God to want to be in his presence above all things. You can be in God's presence wherever you are, in your car, in, at work. At work when I'm, I'm doing my thing, I, you know, driving a, a, my center rider, I'm, I'm just, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for your goodness to us and upon us in the land of the living. Thank you for favor. Thank you. 
for your love, your mercy. You can praise God, you know, wherever you are and understand that God, you, is in your presence. He's in your life. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So to desire his presence and to desire to know him. One of the things I always say is, Lord, I want to know you more today than I did yesterday. It doesn't matter how long you're walking with the Lord. I want to know him. And that's why the, the David's final thing was, and to inquire in his temple. The desire to inquire in the temple, what does that mean? It means you want to learn from the Lord. I want to learn from God. I haven't learned it all. Every time you read the scriptures, God can bring something new out of it, can he? Right? God is always showing. We can never, I, I, we can never learn enough. In our infinite, our, in, in our little minds up here, we can't comprehend all there is to God. We can't understand all there is to God. We just never could. We can't. I don't care how long you study, how long you go to school, how long you whatever. You cannot comprehend the full scope of God. But what we do understand of God is he loves me. He cares for me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He will always be with me in every situation and circumstance of my life. And I can trust him. He's powerful. He's caring. And so it, David, when he says he wanted to inquire, it, re, it really, literally means to plow into, I really want to get into knowing God. I, I, it's my desire. I want to know God more than anything else. And actually, you know, when we got married, I wanted to know my wife. I wanted to know more about her every day. Oh, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning. <laughs> but that's how it is with God. God wants us to continue to learn about the Lord, how much he loves us. We can't fully comprehend that. And so his priority was to know God. The Bible says, you know, that we want to know God. We want to know his word. His word is full of exceeding great and precious promises, promises to you and me. And if we don't read the God, word of God, if we don't get to know him, how are we going to know the precious promises that, that are great and exceeding above everything we could ask or imagine? God makes promises to you that he wants to be in your life, to see you through, help you, give you guidance and wisdom. You know, I, I believe God for everything. When I'm studying, I say, Lord, help me. Give me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in this matter. Help me to understand. And whenever we do that, God always somehow gives, opens a light bulb, goes on, and, and you find out the right thing to do to, to fix it or to to get, you know, to do what needs to get done. There's times I tried and tried and tried. It's like you're up against a stone wall. And then I say, what am I doing? Lord, help me. Give me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Open my eyes to, and boom, there are a simple solution, and, and, and it's done. Because you turn to the Lord. You see, and to take God's word and to apply it to a heart. See, the thing is this. David wanted to inquire of God in his temple, in his presence. That's the key. If you were to hit the lottery today and you were to win $500 million, what would you do? Who would you talk to? What would you say? Who do I go to? Where, what do I do with $500 million? Huh? Who are you going to go to for advice? If you hit a wall in your life and I... I, I there, how do I get beyond this? How do I, I, I can't go any further. How do, I, how do I progress beyond this? Who are you going to inquire of? Someone who, who, who has dynamite and breaking down a wall? No, you turn to God. And whether you're being by hit by situations or circumstances in life, who do you inquire of? Now, you, talk, you can talk to the people around your life that love you, and they'll give you advice. You'll get all kinds of advice. You'll get differing advice. Who do you go to? Not that they're bad. They love you. They care. And they're giving you the best that they think they can give you, right? But the one who is all wise, all knowing, who is God Almighty, he's the one that you need to inquire of. Whether you win a million bucks or whether you need ten bucks, you inquire of God. And God will bring the help that you need when you need it for what you need. He's the light that lights our path. And so David, see, David had a heart of praise and worship. 
So what do we need, what do we need to, to take away from here? Is number one, that our lives, we face a lot of stuff in life, don't we? People are abandoned. People come down with diseases. There's slander that comes against people. There's threats made to people's lives. There's death of family and loved ones. There's natural disasters, financial devastating, other kinds of situations and circumstances that are part of life that come against us all. No one is exempt from the situations and circumstances of life. Sometimes we go through a period when everything seems nice and good. Other times it's like every day, like, what else can go wrong? What else can go wrong? So what do we do? We turn to God and we inquire of the Lord. Lord, I know you love me. I know you're all wise and all knowing. I know you care about me. I know you care about my job. I know you care about my finances. I know you care about my health. I know you uh, care about my, my schooling. I know you care about whatever. Give me guidance. Give me wisdom. Give me knowledge. Give me understanding in these matters and see me through. Seek his face and say, Lord, I want to know you. And second, we have to understand that God, when you pray, he hears you. David knew when he prayed, God heard him. And that's why the Bible says pray always in all things. Like David, pray, but pray with faith, believing God, believing God. Jesus says if you pray, when you pray, if you believe, it shall be given unto you. It shall be done unto you. So when you need an answer, seek the face of God. Pray to the Lord God. Inquire in the Lord and understand that you need to trust him. Trust in God because he cares for you. Casting all your care upon the Lord for he careth for you. I don't know anyone else in this world who can do for me what God can do. I love my wife and she loves me. But there's only so much we can do for one another, can't we? But I know the things that I can't do, God can do, right? I can bring her flowers. I don't need to ask God, say, well, should I bring her flowers or not? I'll bring her flowers, right? But when she needs something that's beyond me, who am I going to go to? The Lord. And when I need something, who is she going to go to that she can't provide for me? The Lord. And that's what David understood. No matter what, go to the Lord. Trust him. He's the glory and the lifter of your head. And that's why David said, my desire, my one desire is to know God, to seek his presence, to be with him, to behold his beauty, and to inquire in his temple. And if we do that, that's why God sent his only begotten son, his Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Not only does God, through Jesus Christ, save your soul and promise you eternity, but he promises to walk with you all the days of your life, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Doesn't God never says, I'll be right back. I got to do something. I'll be right back. Don't go away. God always is with us all the days of our lives to do us good. Ask Jesus into your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to be your Savior and your Lord. Ask him to walk with you that you may know him and love him and understand his love for you. And no matter what situation or circumstance you're in in your life, let God direct you and counsel you and deliver you through it all. God is a wonderful Savior and Lord. We cannot live life without him. David says, love your life. Desire other things that are good, but desire God above all things in this life. Father, we just pray that you will seal this word in each of our lives, O oh Lord God. And Father, no matter what we're going through in our lives, no matter what we've done in our past, all that matters is what we do today. Lord, that we ask you to come into our lives and be our Savior and our Lord and our Redeemer. Forgive us of our sins, Lord God.
Cleanse us of all our iniquities, O Lord, and clothe us in your righteousness, Lord God. Jesus, thank you for going to Calvary's cross, that all our sins may be washed away, and that, Lord, you raise us up to new life in you. And enter into our lives, Lord Jesus, to guide us and lead us and teach us in the way that we should go, knowing that you will always be there to help us and guide us. And no matter what your situation or circumstance is today, turn to the Lord God. Seek his face. Understand his heart of love for you. Cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. And so I pray that God will bless each and every one gathered here today. And as you go, we go from this place, but not from his presence. May the blessings of the Lord be upon you all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing song?
4.10, better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. I pray that you've been blessed with the word of God this morning, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will seal it within our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for your word that nourishes us and grows us in our most holy faith. Thank you for everyone present in this house today, Lord God. I pray your blessing upon them, Lord. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one. Watch over them, Lord, as they go from this place, but not from your presence. Help us all, Lord God, to seek your face on a daily basis. Lord, with every breath we breathe, may we seek your holy face. May we continue to meditate on the wonders of your love. And may we trust you with all that is within us. Now bless your people, again, as they go from your, this place, but not from your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.